Hello, this is the Indiana Department of Natural Resources, Division of Entomology and Plant Pathology. Thank you very much for joining us today. Before we begin, we want to thank all those who supplied photographs and other graphics for this presentation. We're going to briefly discuss eight different invasive insects that could and do impact Indiana's landscape. Before we begin talking about insects, we should define invasive. First, it is non-native the ecosystem under consideration and whose introduction does or is likely to cause some type of harm. This graphic here is an example using plants. There are plants that are not native to Indiana, like tulips and boxwoods, but don't cause harm to people, pets, or the environment. There are also plants that are native to Indiana, like poison ivy, that can cause harm when humans come into contact with it. That point in the middle is where the term invasive lives. It's important to remember that exotic does not mean it's harmful and invasive. To be invasive, both conditions should be met. It should cause harm and be non-native. There are lots of reasons why we should all care about invasive species. Invasive plants can limit the use of lands, inhibit recreational pursuits, can destabilize soil and alter hydrology of water. The natural ecosystem of an area can be drastically altered when native plants can't compete with the invasive ones. Most invasive plants do not provide the same level of nutrition that native insects and wildlife depend on. Many wildlife species won't feed on invasive plants, which can alter overall population numbers and where those populations may be found, both for native plants and for animals. Invasive insects can change the landscape as well, in some cases decimating entire species. Think emerald ash borer and the death of millions of ash trees due to the accidental introduction of that species. Whether dealing with invasive insects or plants, the money spent to combat them is huge. It's estimated that about $137 billion a year is spent on invasive species detection, control, and eradication. There are many ways invasive species can be introduced into a new environment. For insects, egg masses can be moved on firewood, or in the case of species like Lamantria dispar, formerly known as gypsy moth or spotted lanternfly, those egg masses can be moved on anything that's left outside at the right time of year. Adults of many species can hitch a ride on ships, rail cars, semi trucks, or any vehicle moving long distances. Some species of insects can be moved in soil, solid wood packing material, or nearly any agricultural product. There are hundreds of invasive species of plants, animals, and diseases already known in the U.S., with more being identified every day. Each of these pests has a significant impact on our resources. Today, we're going to give a brief overview of eight invasive insects. Three of those have been found in Indiana and are currently being managed by Indiana DNR. The eight insects that are of special concern right now here in Indiana include Lamantria dispar, again, formerly known as gypsy moth, hemlock woolly adelgid, elongate hemlock scale, Asian longhorn beetle, elm zigzag sawfly, box tree moth, Asian giant hornet, and spotted lanternfly. Lamantria dispar doesn't belong in North America. They are native to parts of Europe, Asia, and Northern Africa and were first brought to the United States in the 1860s by a French scientist who wanted to breed Lamantria with silk moths with the hopes of creating a lucrative silk market in the United States that would be inexpensive to feed. Silk moths are extremely particular about what they eat. He chose Lamantria dispar to cross with silk moths because they are not particular about what they feed on. They will eat the leaves of over 500 types of trees and shrubs, Silk moths and Lamantria are not even in the same insect family, so they cannot breed with each other. Identification of Lamantria can be made using the distinctive markings found on the wings of both males and females, which is a chevron pointing to a dot. Females are white, so that these markings stand out fairly well. Males are much darker in color, so that chevron can be more difficult to see. Even though a silk trade wasn't created in the U.S., an expensive new industry of controlling Lamantria dispar was started. 
This species readily feeds on over 500 types of plants. This is a very small list of species Lamantria has been found feeding on. Oak is the most preferred host and are often the first species to see defoliation in heavy outbreak areas. But when a preferred host can't be found, there are plenty of other species that will do. Since that first introduction, Lamantria dispar has found very suitable habitat throughout the eastern U.S. and is currently established in the northern part of Indiana as well, where it can cause the foliation of trees, interfere with outdoor activities, and just generally be a nuisance to homeowners. It is in the larval stage of this invasive moth that causes the most damage. Caterpillars feed ferociously as they grow and get ready to pupate. Several years in a row of defoliation can kill healthy trees. Once they are adults, they do not feed, but only seek out a mate to complete their life cycle. Females cannot fly because they are so heavy with eggs, so they attract males to them using pheromones. After mating, females look for protected areas to lay their egg masses. Those egg masses can be laid anywhere. Each egg mass can contain anywhere from 500 to 1,000 eggs. This is the stage where it is often transported to new areas, but one mated female ready to lay an egg mass that hitchhikes on vehicles or outdoor equipment can be problematic. This can be seen here, egg masses on tires, under picnic tables, anywhere the female finds that she believes is protected. To help prevent the spread of this and other invasive species, always check anything stored outdoors prior to moving it. Next up is hemlock woolly adelgid. These sap suckers can be found in western North America where it has likely been present for thousands of years and causes only minor damage to western hemlocks due to natural predators and some host resistance. Populations found in the eastern U.S., however, are genetically linked to populations in Japan. It was first likely introduced into Richmond, Virginia in the 1950s on nursery stock, making this an introduced and destructive pest with no natural enemies or host resistance in this area. HWA is all female in northeastern North America. Uh, they develop asexually and have six stages of development, uh, an egg, four nymphal instars in an adult. There are two overlapping generations per year. In its native areas, the life cycle of the hemlock woolly adelgid is complex, involving both hemlock and spruce trees. In the spring, the eggs hatch and the nymphs feed and mature. One generation is winged and leave the hemlock in search of spruce trees. Once a spruce tree is found, the insects mate and lay eggs. In Asia, the eggs hatch and feed on the spruce tree. In the eastern U.S., those winged adults die if there are any present. The life stage most homeowners would likely notice is the white cottony egg sacs seen here. There are four species of hemlock native to North America. In native stands of Eastern and Carolina hemlock, HWA has been devastating, uh, causing uh, defoliation and tree death. Um, this map is a close-up of the historic range of hemlocks in the Eastern US. The dark brown and yellow areas are where HWA has been found. The two pink counties in Michigan were detected in 2015 and are under eradication. HWA was found in LaPorte County, Indiana in 2012 in a couple of landscape trees. Those trees were destroyed and HWA has been eradicated from Indiana. But we're still surveying for this pest, not only to protect our small native stands of eastern hemlock, but also to protect uh, our landscape plantings. Another threat to hemlock is elongate hemlock scale. Uh, this scale feeds on over 50 different species of trees. Believed to have been introduced into the U.S. from Japan, this species was first found in New York in 1908. The scale is small, typically on the underside of the needles, and can be found 
uh, can be difficult to see in low populations. Damage includes yellow banding on the needles or overall needle yellowing and needle loss. Severe damage can produce branch dieback and lead to the eventual death of the tree. Scales are small insects with piercing, sucking mouth parts that feed on the sap of plants. They secrete a waxy coating for defense and are stationary once they begin feeding. In colder climates, there is only one generation a year of elongate hemlock scale, but in southern regions, there are two. This insect can overwinter either as an egg or as a female carrying fertilized eggs. Overwinter eggs hatch in the early spring, while the overwintered females produce eggs throughout the spring, resulting in a crawler stage that lasts for an extended period of time. Crawlers move to new growth where they settle, feed, and develop into adults. Adult males have wings, and in warmer regions, find females to produce a second generation and eggs produced by the second generation females give rise to the over overwintering individuals. Currently found in several eastern states, control of elong elongate hemlock scale can be very difficult since the crawler stage can overlap with the adult stage. As with many pests, human-assisted movement is critical to their successful invasion into new areas. If buying holiday greenery, inspect it for elongate hemlock scale, and when the season's over, do not toss material into the backyard woods or compost pile. Properly dispose of trees and wreaths by using your city or county tree and greenery pickup or by burning. Uh, always know and follow your local ordinances with regards to destruction but always destroy this type of material. The next insect we're going to discuss is Asian longhorn beetle. In its native areas, one of the things ALB is called is starry sky beetles because of their unique pattern of white spots over their black bodies. As with most invasive pests in their natural habitats, they cause little damage and can be managed. These distinctive looking beetles can be up to one and a half inches long with their striped antenna measuring the length of their body and beyond, hence why they are called long horned beetles. In the United States, ALB has found an abundance of suitable hosts. While they heavily prefer maple trees, they also actively feed on buckeyes, elms, and willows. If none of these is available, birch, sycamore, poplar, ash, mountain ash, Golden Rain Tree, Mimosa, and Katsura are acceptable host material. ALB causes significant damage to the structure of trees. Eggs hatch in the fall, and the larvae quickly burrow under the bark where they begin feeding. As they grow, they move deeper and deeper into the heartwood of the branch, damaging its structural integrity. These long galleries make branches weak and prone to breakage. The larva and pupa are protected from long cold winters deep within the wood, and the next spring, adults emerge from perfectly round holes about three-eighths inch in diameter. Trees will, show, trees will not show obvious signs of decline until the infestation level is very high. When scouting for possible signs of ALB, look for large exit holes that go deep into the tree. Look for egg-laying sites called oviposition pits, where the female has chewed a small depression to lay a single egg into. Look for frass at the base of trees and in branch notches or coming out of the egg-laying sites. If branches break off, look for large tunnels deep inside the wood. ALB has been found in several areas over the last 25 years often accidentally introduced in wood packing material. It was first discovered in the U.S. in 1996, Brooklyn, New York. Currently, areas New York, Massachusetts, Ohio, and South Carolina have active ALB quarantines and eradication efforts. In 2001, a pop in 2011, in 2011, a population was discovered in Claremont County, Ohio, just east of Cincinnati, where eradication efforts have been successful in two outlier populations and continues in the main area. Eradication of this beetle is possible. Several U.S. introductions, including sites in Illinois, New Jersey, and parts of New York, have been successfully eradicated. Uh, here's an outlier population, and here's another. 
And again, both of those have successfully eradicated and eradication efforts continue in this area. The next four insects we're going to cover are all new to the U.S. Elm zigzag sawfly was discovered May 13th of 2021 in Virginia. This competitive little sawfly uh, could have a large impact on native elm browsers already reeling from significant decline of elm trees due to Dutch elm disease, not to mention the effect this insect can have on the trees themselves. Native to East Asia, it's a minor pest in its home range, but since it was found in Hungary and Poland in 2003, it has moved rapidly through Europe, feasting on foliage as it goes, and has caused localized severe defoliation in the United Kingdom. Negative impacts have been observed on native moth and butterfly species because of elm zigzag sawfly. Virginia currently has seven counties where, where elm zigzag sawfly has been confirmed. It's not been confirmed in any other state yet, but it is something we want to be on the lookout for. What its potential impact might be isn't yet clear. Elm zigzag sawfly could be identified by the unique feeding pattern of the larva and by the distinctive lattice-like cocoons that can be found on the underside of leaves eaten by the larva. This species overwinters as a pupa inside these dense cocoons. And these cocoons can easily go unnoticed in leaf litter. Larva can be found beginning in spring until early fall. And that's because there are up to six generations a year in areas where it has been introduced. Adult females only live for one to six days. But since they reproduce asexually, they can begin laying eggs upon emergence from their cocoon. A single female can lay almost 50 eggs along the serrated edges of an elm leaf. Larvae feed for approximately two to three weeks before forming their dense cocoons. Adults will emerge seven to 10 days after that. Severe defoliation and branch dieback are also symptoms of significant populations of elm zigzag sawfly. A single year defoliation isn't likely to kill healthy trees. Um, but can be devastating for trees already under stress. Several years in a row of defoliation can kill even strong trees. This pest is a particularly strong flyer and can fly more than 50 miles a year on its own. That appears to be one reason why it has successfully colonized much of Europe. Box tree moth is another newcomer to North America. This native to East Asia has become a serious pest in Europe where several species of boxwoods are native. In 2021, a nursery in Canada near Niagara Falls shipped material that may have been infested into six U.S. states. Much of that material was traced down and destroyed, but some material was unable to be found due to cash sales. State regulatory officials in effective states continue to work with nurseries and other stakeholders to survey and destroy materials necessary. This pest is easily moved on host material since the egg clusters are small and typically on the underside of leaves. It's believed that is how it's moving so readily through Europe and now into North America. While they feed mostly on boxwood plants, they also feed on euonymus and holly species. Once the foliation has taken place, caterpillars will begin feeding on bark which effectively girdles the shrubs, killing them. During the growing season, life stages will often overlap since there are several generations a year. Egg masses can go unnoticed on the bottom of leaves, but as caterpillars feed, they can reach up to one and a half inches long. As plants become more infested and defoliated, the webbing and feeding damage become more evident. Adults can be either a lark, uh, can be either adults can be either a light or dark form of the moth and have a wingspan of nearly two inches. This next pest has been in the news a great deal in the last year because it was found in Washington State and was given an unfortunate moniker that we should uh, refrain from using. There are several common names associated with this Vespa species. Asian giant hornet is the most common right now, and the one we'll use here 
AGH is a member of the wasp family and has the honor of being the world's largest hornet. Hornets are a type of wasp. So all hornets are wasps, but not all wasps are hornets. This species of hornet is native to temperate and tropical areas in Asia and parts of the Russian Far East. The honeybee industry in the United States is estimated to be worth over $4 billion and responsible for more than 22,000 jobs. If AGH were to become established in the United States, it could cause immeasurable damage to the honeybee industry. In the fall, AGH will attack and kill honeybees by beheading the adults and then defending the hive as their own, using the honeybee larva to feed their own young. While this wasp isn't particularly aggressive towards humans, it will defend its nest and attack if threatened. It has an extremely powerful sting and can sting multiple times. Those stings can cause serious medical complications, especially for those who may be allergic. This possible economic threat, coupled with the harm to human health, are just two reasons why officials are working so hard to eradicate this invasive insect. First detected in Washington State in September 2019, officials destroyed the first AGH nest in October 2020. Officials continue to monitor and survey for this pest. Washington State Department of Agriculture has placed about 850 traps to monitor for AGH. All agencies rely on public reports of invasive species, but WSDA is taking full advantage of citizen scientists. Over 1,500 AGH traps have been placed and are monitored by citizens in the Blaine area. This has led to several confirmed sightings in 2021 and the destruction of three more nests. It's important to get nests destroyed before new queens can emerge and be mated. Again, early nest destruction is important because only fertilized queens survive the winter. Males and workers die, leaving the fertilized queens to start new nests the next spring. To overwinter, she will find a protected area, an area she excavates in the soil or, uh, or rotting wood or piles of straw, anywhere she can be protected from the elements. When she emerges in the spring, she looks for a suitable nesting site, usually some pre-existing underground cavities with narrow openings, such as rodent burrows, but nests can be created in hollow trees as well. After a suitable site is found, she begins to build the nest, forage, lay eggs, and care for the young. In the summer, when there are around 40 workers, the queen becomes nest bound. In the late summer, early fall, the colony begins to produce males and next year's queens. It's during this time, workers will attack honeybee hives to obtain a higher protein food. They may attack other social bees and wasps at this time as well. Once a hive has been attacked, they will defend it as their own. There are a number of larger insects that are often confused with AGH. Oftentimes, native cicada killers are thought to be AGH based on their size, uh, but the banding on the abdomen of the cicada killer is much more yellow and black, and the cicada killer head is smaller than the thorax as seen here. There are a number, uh, uh, there is another introduced Vespa species that is found in the US. It can be difficult to distinguish these two species apart, especially if you only catch a glimpse while in flight. But when looking at the abdomen, the markings are very different. AGH has a banded abdomen, while European hornets have an almost teardrop pattern. European hornets can be slightly smaller than their cousins, uh, but still not a wasp to tangle with. They also have very powerful stings. Last up today is spotted lanternfly, another news headline from the last year. This plant hopper has piercing sucking mouth parts to feed on the sap of plants. It's native to several parts of Asia and was first detected in the U.S. in 2014 in Pennsylvania, though it was likely introduced several years earlier. As populations of this pest increase, some favored hosts can be killed, grapevines, for example, 
Also, the large amount of honeydew produced and the sooty mold that grows on it can be a nuisance for homeowners and interfere with many outdoor activities. The honeydew can attract lots of other insects, including bees and wasps, creating the possibility of being stung. The adult is approximately one inch long and a half an inch wide at rest. The forewing is gray with black spots and the wing tips are reticulated black blocks outlined in gray. The hind wings have contrasting patches of red and black with a white band. The legs and head are black. The abdomen is yellow with broad black bands. Immature stages are black with white spots and develop red patches as they grow. This species has been noted feeding on 56 different species of plants. Feeding preference changes as the insect develops, but Tree of Heaven is by far a favorite host at all life stages, which is unfortunate since that invasive tree is extremely prevalent in many areas. It also uh, feeds on uh, walnuts and loves grapevines. The nymphs are much smaller than adults. Uh, egg masses are laid by adults in the late summer through the fall. Eggs <coughs> hatch in the spring and nymphs spend all spring and most of the summer feeding and growing. The first through third instar nymphs are black with white dots and are very small. The first instar nymph is only about one eighth of an inch in length and will reach about a quarter of an inch in size as it reaches the third instar. The size and color make them extremely difficult to see. Even uh, the fourth instar nymphs that are bright red can be uh, hard to find as uh, can be seen in this bottom photo. The nymph, which is only about a half an inch long, can be seen here circled in yellow. Uh, the adults and egg masses can be just as difficult to find. The egg masses darken in color as they age, and once they've hatched, they can look like a normal part of the tree. Newly laid egg masses, uh, seen here, it may seem brighter in color, but uh, even then may not stand out enough to be easily seen, uh, depending on what the eggs uh, were laid on. Adults are large when compared to the nymphs, but as plant hoppers, they move away quickly if disturbed, and the gray forewings do not stand out when feeding on trees. Movement of spotted lanternfly is mostly through human dispersal. They have moved along highways, railroad corridors, and the like. These areas typically have an abundant amount of tree of heaven and wild grape, providing a good food source. As noted earlier, SLF has been, feed, has been seen feeding on 56 different plant species. Uh, feeding preference changes with life stage development, but SLF will always feed on Tree of Heaven. In the summer of 2021, SLF was reported by a landowner in Switzerland County. Since that initial report, Members of several state and federal agencies continue to survey for the insect and for Tree of Heaven. Several other states, including Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Kentucky, have come to Indiana to share their knowledge and help with this population. Treatments include using Dynatefron to kill adults, using traps to monitor populations, and marking Tree of Heaven for removal. SLF loves Tree of Heaven. And the most common and effective means of treatment is by limiting the number of tree of heaven in an area that will concentrate feeding onto a few trees treated with dinotephron, thereby killing the adults. Unfortunately, SLF has been in this location for several years and is an actively reproducing population. Uh, treatment and survey will continue in the early fall and will resume in 2022. It takes everyone working together to protect Indiana's resources. We need to keep ourselves informed of the latest pests, but aside from that, there are lots of ways we can all protect our landscapes. Human movement is the quickest way for these invaders to move and expand their regions. Don't move firewood. There are 140 known pests that can be moved on firewood, including most of those discussed today. Buy your firewood where you're going to use it or buy certified firewood to limit pest movement. When moving camping equipment or anything that's left outdoors, inspect it for pests and egg masses prior to movement. Uh, 
Never flush or release anything into the wild. Aquarium plants and animals aren't meant to be in the wild. They are more often than not exotic species. They can cause a lot of harm if released into the environment. If you like to do a lot of hiking or bike riding or any type of trail riding, remember to clean your boots and other equipment prior to entering an area and after leaving it. Cleaning seeds, soil, and other debris from equipment before and after using a new area helps make sure it's done thoroughly. Cleaning boats and water equipment is important as, as well. Even if your boat hasn't been in the water for a while, there are several invasive species that have the ability to survive even in extreme conditions. Anyone importing or exporting agricultural goods should contact us. There are many different requirements for different goods, and those requirements depend on where it's going to. On the same port, point uh, importing goods into the U.S. or even just into Indiana from other U.S. states has the potential to bring in pests, pathogens, and diseases. When buying any live plant material or even seed, make sure you know where the material is sourced and ensure you're dealing with a licensed and reputable company. Just because you can buy it online doesn't necessarily mean you should. It can seem overwhelming to keep up with uh, different quarantines, but know that there are many quarantines in the U.S. that prohibit the movement of certain articles out of or into certain areas. When in doubt, contact us. We'll help you figure it out. Uh, see something that d just doesn't look right? Contact us. Report it. Agricultural officials can't be everywhere. We rely on informed, concerned citizens to make reports. Even when it turns out to be nothing of significance, we'd rather get 100 calls that turn out not to be a pest than to miss that one positive. The more time pests go unnoticed, the more harm they cause and the more difficult they are to control. There are many ways for Hoosiers to report invasive species. EdMaps is a great resource for reporting invasive plant species that have escaped cultivation like garlic mustard, stiltgrass, Japanese barberry, or burning bush. If reporting a possible sighting of anything covered here today, it's best to contact the Division of Entomology and Plant Pathology directly by either calling us at 1-866-NO-EXOTIC. That's 1-866-NO-EXOTIC. 663-9684 or by emailing us at dep at dnr.in.gov. Whether calling or emailing, always remember to leave your name, contact number, what you saw, when you saw it, and very importantly, where you saw it. The more specific you can be on the location of the possible invasive insect, the better. Getting pictures, if you can safely do so, is a great way for us to help identify the possible pest more quickly. We rely greatly on concerned and involved Hoosiers to help protect all of Indiana's natural resources. Thank you very much for your time today. Again, feel free to contact us with any questions or comments.